Hello, good uh, <clears throat> afternoon to everybody for uh, also coming back after lunch. Um, I'm glad to see that the, the room is still uh, full. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me uh, here. And thinking about the first uh, speech, uh, the welcoming speech, and uh, where the vice rector talked about the situation in Europe and globally, and Croatia is one of these places where there is this um, strong revisionism. I come, come from Croatia, and I guess we can talk about the, uh, the other Yugoslav successor states more generally. And um, so when I was asked to talk about the memory of the Spanish Civil War uh, in Croatia and the former Yugoslavia, I knew that I had to like put it in the context of what was going on in general in, uh, with revisionism. So I've, I'll start with an introduction about the Yugoslavs uh, in Spain, what they did in the Second World War, what the memory was like during socialist Yugoslavia, and then and a bit of a dark note uh, with the current situation in uh, Croatia, but in other places. And I also have the second edition of this uh, pamphlet that was published uh, by Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Uh, so if people are interested in, uh, in it, I have a, a number of copies for free, so you're welcome to, to come up after the, the lecture and I can share them. Uh, so I wanted to initially say who were these Yugoslav volunteers? Uh, many of them were uh, soldiers, but other ones served there also as journalists, as artists. And then the, these woodcuts are from uh, a volunteer that was sent uh, to do propaganda work, basically. And he later also became very important during the Second World War in Yugoslavia in designing a lot of the, the art. I mean, I think we've, we're all aware of the power of uh, art and painting and other um, arts that came out of uh, the Spanish Civil War. Just to show you the situation uh, of Yugoslavia in the 1930s, it was uh, divided into these so-called banovinas. It was an attempt to destroy national identity. So the Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, uh, Bosnian Muslims, they didn't really have the republics that they would have later or the independent states that we have now. It was an attempt to create a Yugoslav nationality. But there was, of course, a tension. And so the Yugoslavs that went and fought in Spain came from a country that already had a dictatorship. It wasn't uh, a fascist dictatorship, but it was definitely an authoritarian system. So when they went to fight in Spain, they had the idea that they would come back and carry the revolution to Yugoslavia from, from the very beginning. So if all the documents and the, the letters that you can read in the archives, they're really they're fighting in Spain, but their real goal is to come back and carry the revolution back to Yugoslavia. And the main organizer, as in many other countries, was the Communist Party of Yugoslavia. Very early on, they formed this Yugoslav National Committee, which is based in, in Paris. And at the time of the Spanish Civil War, the general secretary is this guy named Milan Gorkic, nicknamed Zomer, uh, also based in, in Spain, or sorry, in, in Paris. Uh, but during the course of the actual Spanish Civil War, there's a lot of internal fighting, and not directly because of Spain, but certainly part, partly due to the war in Spain, we have the emergence of a new general secretary, and maybe many of you know here, name of uh, Josip Broz uh, Tito, who had other uh, code names of uh, Walter or Otto. Um, he would really become known as Tito only during the war in Yugoslavia, but he's in charge of organizing the volunteers. He also comes to, Spain, or to, to Paris briefly and organizing the volunteers that are then going into Spain. So the role of the Communist Party is crucial, but only about half of the volunteers were actually uh, Communist Party members. The rest were uh, from all different kinds of political backgrounds. So we can see the way that the Communist Party of Yugoslavia thought about the, the war in Spain. I mean, here's just one of the, the from a, a letter from October 1936, Spain is the central question of all international politics. The struggle of the heroic Spanish people is not just a struggle which will result in the victory or defeat of democracy only in Spain, rather it is the beginning of an armed conflict between fascism and democracy of the entire world. So I think they uh, really had this much broader vision. Of course, the Communist Party of Yugoslavia was part of the Comintern and they weren't really making autonomous decisions necessarily, but definitely in the internal letters and communications we can see that they're 
uh, idea was not just limited to Spain, but going further. How did the Yugoslav volunteers uh, get to Spain? There were initially uh, hopes to mobilize huge numbers to bring them over, because uh, there was a lot of people who wanted to go and, and, and fight in Spain. And one of the earlier ideas was to organize this ship, um, which was almost 200 volunteers were to get on this ship. It was sailing from Montenegro, then to the Dalmatian coast, and then bring them over. But the Communist Party was quite infiltrated by police agents and so on. And so this episode ends rather in a big disaster. A number of them get arrested. And this actually uh, leads to Gorkic's fall. And so Milan Gorkic, he's recalled back to Moscow and then disappears in Stalin's purges. And there's this period between 37 to 39 where Tito is the de facto general secretary, but he's not really confirmed until 1939. Uh, but so this, the Spanish uh, chapter of the, Yug the Yugoslav Communist Party is actually really quite crucial for uh, the future developments. And after that, the volunteers come in much smaller numbers. Also, many of the volunteers didn't come directly from Yugoslavia. Uh, many Yugoslav workers were working in uh, Belgium, France, some were working in Spain, uh, many came from North America. So a lot of them came from different parts of Europe and the world. And another important segment was uh, the students. I mean, we, we all know also the importance of youth and young people in revolutionary movements. Uh, the, the Yugoslav students studying in Prague were no, were no different. And uh, a number of these volunteers that did come from Prague uh, in a student group, they all came and about a group of 20 of them decided to leave their skiing vacation and then all came to, uh, to Spain and they became quite important also later in the Yugoslav revolution. So just to give you an idea of some of the, the main uh, units that they fought in, uh, the Dimitrov Battalion of, of the 15th uh, Brigade and they had their own newspaper, the uh, Dimitrovats, and then we had the Djokovic Battalion and some later um, different units and so on. They're also in, involved in uh, the medical corps. I give here the, this uh, image of the statue and uh, it's named after Matija Gubets, who was a, a 16th century Croatian peasant leader of an uprising. And so even though the, the volunteers, many of them consider themselves to be Yugoslav uh, as you know, a unit uh, um, unified and in a sort of an, an internationalist sense, there was still the, the national question in Yugoslavia. And actually the Communist Party uh, even creates the Croatian Communist Party and the Slovene Communist Party in 1937. So there's on one hand this supranational Yugoslav identity, but also national uh, identity. And uh, choosing to name a, a unit after a Croatian peasant leader was a very conscious effort by the Communist Party, and in fact, this was used in their material sent back into the country. Look, Croats are fighting in Spain under the name of this peasant leader, and they will then bring revolution back to Yugoslavia and back to Croatia. And the numbers, uh, for a long time, the number of about 1,700 was the standard official number, but um, more recent research by a French scholar uh, in his dissertation, he writes about 1,900 total Yugoslav volunteers. And here's just giving you a sense of where they came from. You can see uh, the majority come from Croatia and Slovenia. And as we heard also earlier from the presenter on, on Poland, not all of these, just because they came from Croatia, didn't mean they were Croat. They were also Serbs from Croatia or Croats from Bosnia and so on. One reason why many come from Croatia is not necessarily uh, because they were particularly more revolutionary, uh, but many of them were actually the ones working abroad. So a lot of the Croats actually came, these were the ones who were already based in France or Belgium or North America. I'm not going to get into the all the details here, but I mean, we can see that they were involved, the, the Yugoslav units were involved in many of the most important battles of the, of the international brigades. And since we're talking and uh, here, and we're, we're, we're gathered here about the 80th um, anniversary of the leaving of the international brigades, the Yugoslav volunteers actually don't return home. They actually stay and are, are incorporated into 
Spanish units because they lose their citizenship when they come uh, to Spain. So also probably those who are from Austria or it, uh, Italy where they had uh, fascist regimes, uh, they couldn't go back. So the Yugoslav volunteers stayed to the very, very end of, <clears throat> of the war. Just another quote. Um, so Proletet is the main communist uh, newspaper that was published in the 1930s. And again, we can even see the call to sort of Croatian patriotism or nationalism in, in this quote. So, you know, they're saying that Zagreb is actually being defended in front of Madrid by the Croatian communist, um, with hundreds of volunteers of all nationalities from Yugoslavia. So, so we see this d duality of both having this international pan-Yugoslav identity, but also playing to Croatian national feelings, and this is the, this commander, he's the highest ranking uh, Yugoslav in the Spanish Civil War, uh, and he also is recalled to Moscow and then disappears in the purges. Uh, I already mentioned uh, George Andreevich Kuhn, he's the artist. He wanted to fight in the trenches with the others, but he was giving a directive, no, you have to uh, do the, the wood carving and the painting and then transmit the ideas for the future generations. And so he, as I said, he also was important during the partisans in Yugoslavia. He designed uh, actually the coat of arms of Yugoslavia, which you may have seen with the, um, the torches and the, and, the, and the star. And one of the highest ranking members of the Yugoslav uh, Communist Party who sent in 1937 uh, to the international brigades actually dies in battle, uh, Blagoje Parovic, uh, as part of the 13th uh, Brigade. And why I'm bringing him up specifically is there was, uh, as I said, there were a lot of internal fighting and uh, settling of accounts. And the Parovic case is often brought up, um, especially since the 1980s and 1990s, in this wave of revisionism and the collapse of Yugoslavia, as one of these conspiracy theories that it was actually Tito liquidating a, a potential rival for control. And one of the arguments for that is this image that was taken of Parovic on the battle site, allegedly with a bullet hole in his back. Uh, so, you know, was he, you know, shot by an AK, uh, NKVD agent, uh, Vlajko Begovic, who was the guy who took this photograph. And I'll get to Begovic a little bit later. Uh, but I mean, I'm sure in the chaos of the battlefield, you know, people were, or maybe he had turned and got hit in the back. But this image was then, has been used since the 1980s and the 1990s as proof of Begovic getting evidence to send back to Tito. After the fall of uh, the Republic, the Yugoslav volunteers share the fate of many of the Republican soldiers and they end up uh, in the French camps. Uh, as you can see here, about almost 500 of them um, uh, end up in these camps. Uh, and this created like a, big, uh, a big movement in Yugoslavia itself to bring these prisoners back. So the, in a way, the Communist Party was getting publicity through this, this campaign, and all kinds of people were signing petitions to release them. In a way, though, I would argue that while Many of the volunteers received experience in the battlefield. It was the experience in the camps that really gave them the party discipline uh, and the unification, the unity, and the, the vision that was then to be so important during the Second World War. Uh, and many of them do then return back to Yugoslavia, and they form, uh, if not, I mean, dealing with the numbers, I mean, they couldn't form the majority of the troops, of course, but they were very important because of their experience and, again, the party discipline to come back, and especially at the beginning of the uprising in Yugoslavia, they were distributed and sent to various units, and they're the ones who would help, um, help guide these, uh, the resistance in, in 1941 and 1942 in particularly. So here we have uh, Tito and Kocha Popovic, uh, a volunteer. Uh, as we can see, about 350 of the Spanish uh, veterans returned to Yugoslavia. I didn't really mention, but about half of them actually die in Spain. Many then re return either to um, 
North America or elsewhere, about 350 or end up in, still end up in prison and, and in concentration camps. About 350 managed to make it back to Yugoslavia and about 250 are active in the uh, People's Liberation War. Uh, here's uh, an, a monument to uh, Žikica Jovanović Spanac. So a lot of the, the veterans had this nickname and were added Spanac, so Spaniard, uh, to the end of their name. And he's important because he um, is, starts the uprising in Serbia in July 7th of 1941. He uh, shoots two um, police officers that come to try to arrest the communists. If we're talking about revisionism and memory now, actually this, that date is no longer a date in, in Serbia and now the, it's commemorated the two police officers that were killed by him. Um, so memory and re memorials and memorialization is changing. And I mentioned here this Vecislav Cvetko Flores and he's in charge of bringing the Yugoslavs who are by 1941, 1942, many of them are in German labor camps, and then they bring them back into Yugoslavia. So it was a very well thought out, well planned uh, mission to bring the, the Spanish veterans back. They come to Zagreb, and then they're sent off to their various missions. And another important thing is they often sent a Croat to Serb areas, or a Serb to a Bosnian area. Again, to this um, idea of what later it comes out is called brotherhood and unity, and to show that not the other side aren't always just killers, because the, the war in Yugoslavia wasn't just between uh, the resistance and the occupiers, but it was a multi-sided ethnic war with a lot of civilians being killed. And one of these Spanish veterans who is sent into the field is Marko Oreshkovic, <clears throat> and we can even see this song that was, or a poem and a song that is, was um, sung during the time and afterwards. Comrade Marko is a Croat by birth, but he's like a mother to the Serbian people, because he was an example of not all Croats are these Ustasha, these Croatian fascists, and he was important in organizing the uprising then. And he's actually even killed by Serb nationalists in 1941. As I said, you know, the numbers of only about 250 is not that large of a number, but they do take up crucial positions. They're often political commissars, they were important in the first two years, and by the end of with the Second World War, there are four main Yugoslav armies, so the partisan armies turn into actual armies, are all led by Spanish veterans. And 59 of the veterans are recognized as people's heroes. This is the highest award given during, um, uh, from the Second World War. 130 of them die during the war. 30 are promoted to the rank of general, so they had quite important careers during, during the war. And after the war, they, after the war they, many of them hold high, positions in diplomacy and uh, in politics and the party and the army uh, and so on. Not all of them made it back to Yugoslavia, but many of them fight in other resistance movements. And I already mentioned Vlajko Begovic. So this is the photographer who took the, the picture of the dead, Blagoje Parovic, earlier. Uh, here are a number of his photos, so also the Alba um, uh, archive has a lot of his uh, photographs because he was in charge of the, the 15th uh, uh, Brigade's um, or to, for, yeah, photograph corps. So there's a lot of very, very interesting uh, photographs of him and just of daily life of Spanish peasants. It's quite interesting to take a look, not just of members uh, in the, uh, or army members in the field. So after the war, the Spanish veterans of a particular um, level. They were the, the first ones to engage in the revolution. And while the Spanish revolution failed in Yugoslavia, they, succeed, they succeeded. And they were known as Nashi Spansi, our Spaniards. Many, many publications uh, about them. But they're also important, actually, individual memory actors. And one of them is Cedo Kapor, also a, um, a volunteer from Bosnia Herzegovina. And he's very crucial in publishing the books, organizing the uh, veteran associations. Um, this, they have an association of Yugoslav volunteers in the Spanish Republican Army. Uh, many books, memoirs, they worked in schools. They had the 50th anniversary in 1986. Uh, and Yugoslavia had actually boycotted Franco Spain until 1977, I mean, two years even after uh, he died. There were many memorials built, not just to partisans who had been Spanish fighters then die in 
the Second World War, but actually there's memorials to those who died in Spain. So here's just two examples of uh, communists who, had, who died in Spain and then subsequently they had monuments uh, built to them. Now before I get to the final uh, part of my uh, talk where I talk about the revisionism, I think it's important to understand that the memory of the Spanish Civil War and the memory of the volunteers was so incorporated and immersed in the general uh, cultural memory and memory politics of the partisans in the Second World War. They were, of course, many of them were also both partisans and Spanish veterans. And so they went to a lot of the different commemorations. Here's a famous uh, monument at Sutiska for those of you who've been following the, there are a lot of memes on the internet about these socialist memorials. This is one of the most famous ones and we can see them uh, posing here. So the commemorative culture Spaniards were very much, the Spans were very much interpreted in it, into it. There were many memoirs of them. Here's just one, August Cesaretz. It's the Spanish Encounters, which was published in 38 in Toronto, but probably only like five of the books actually made it to Yugoslavia and then reprinted in the 60s. Uh, and he's also a famous modernist author beyond being in Spain. So, um, I mean, I guess sort of like a, a Hemingway kind of figure. The partisan, the Spansi were also in the, in the films. Maybe you've also heard of these partisan movies. There's a lot of, a lot of them. Oftentimes, one of the figures is this Spanitz, the older, experienced, revolutionary, sometimes more dogmatic, sometimes more hardline than the local situation on the ground. The, the Spansi could be both a positive and a, maybe even a negative um, uh, element because the situation in Yugoslavia was different than what it was in Spain. But, you can see that the, these characters appear in a number of, of films as well. And, but by the 80s, this sort of aura that they had, these even higher um, revolutionaries, becomes problematic even as the Yugoslav system itself was in crisis and, and uh, falling apart. The Spansi in general become labeled as Narodni Heroi. All of them get this rank, so this is an important uh, event. And then a year later, they become they all also take over this uh, Spomenica of 1941. They have become the first fighters, I think, in the earlier lecture about the, the French veterans. That only happens in the 90s, I suppose, uh, as, as being recognized as, as actual veterans. But they get the equal rights to those who, who rose up in 41. And with their sort of um, legacy, they try to, uh, they write a letter to the Central, uh, Central Committee in 1984 saying, we need to call an extraordinary Congress, we need to deal with the political and economic crisis in Yugoslavia, and then they basically get called in for like a interrogation by the Central uh, Committee, uh, and we can already see that the crisis has gone so long. They basically get also um, tarred in the press as that they were, they're, they're called Slobodni Strelci, or loose cannons. <clears throat> so this, um, rank they had no longer carries its weight. And so I've called it the twilight of the revolutionaries. And so when two years later, the 50th anniversary, they've kind of been sort of shamed in public by, by the regime. And as we go into the 90s, of course, you all know there was a terrible uh, war in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, as the country falls apart, there was a short war in Slovenia, then in, in Croatia, and then a much and the much nastiest, the much nastier war in Bosnia Herzegovina, and then even going to the conflict in Kosovo, uh, and new waves of re revisionism, the destruction of the partisan and the socialist narrative, now replaced by new nationalist narratives, and this affects the memory scape, the destruction of old monuments and anti-fascist monuments, the building of monuments to uh, collaborators. Um, here's another image of this Marko Reshkovic. The one on the ground is uh, from the Dalmatian coast, but the bust is Marko Reshkovic, the, the, the Croat who helped fight for Serbs. Um, this is in Belgrade, and it's been, it's been um, graffitied. Uh, in other lectures, I've spoken a lot about the destruction of memorials. I'm just giving you two examples. I mean, the, the, the upper image was actually looked like a giant fist, but now it's been completely blown up. This is in Bosnia-Herzegovina and the lower one is in Croatia, you know, a, a toppled monument. So physically destroying the land, the memoryscape, and then we have 
Draža Mihailović, who was the leader of the Chetnik movement, which briefly had served as a resistance movement, but then later collaborates with Italians and even the German forces. So collaborators are now being um, celebrated as fighters for uh, nationalist heroes. Uh, the university where I teach at used to be called the barracks of the Spanish volunteers, the Spanish volunteers barracks. And we hear an image from 1991 where they're removing that. Uh, Another, here's the memorial to um, Blagoje Parovic, who was the, the commissar killed in uh, 1937, and he, his monument had a central place in his hometown of Nevesinja in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and now is, has been removed to the outskirts. Even though the square still carries his name, but you can just see now like a big blank spot in the middle of the square. Uh, and why I wanted to talk about the integration of the Spansi and the commemorative process earlier in Croatia especially, but in other areas as well, as the, the rejection, the destruction of the, the, of the partisan heritage, the Spansi are also being thrown out with that, um, you know, throwing out the, the baby with the bathwater. So their fate uh, is also, many monuments have been defaced, uh, damaged, torn down, some of them for material purposes because of the raw materials, other ones because of ideological reasons. And this is also now extended to an attack on Tito because Tito is, at least in Croatia, by many seen as uh, someone who led to this post-war repression against the Croatian people. and. They're trying to say, well, he was already a, an NKVD agent and a liquidator way back in Spain. There's these ideas that he was in Spain shooting people, and they dug out, this is just one example, they dug out this photo. I mean, you can't even see the guy's face, and he's, this is also actually in one of the French camps, so why would Tito go into a French camp? But for these revisionists, it's not important, but we can see how deep the attack to deconstruct everything about uh, the historical past is going. So I'm just going to try to conclude in the next two slides on a slightly more positive note because there is still remembrance practices and there is still, I think, a lot of values and uh, lessons we can take from the Spanish Civil War that isn't always so associated with the post-war communist repression in the former Yugoslavia. This was uh, in 2016, uh, was this conference in Belgrade, and it was also tied into a little commemoration we had. This is the International Brigade Monument in, in Belgrade, and the street of the uh, International Brigades, that's, it leads right to the monument. We can see someone graffitied this public spaces or ours next to it. This was also a very great conference and bringing in politicians and uh, scholars and intellectuals from Spain that participated in this discussion. And I have to do a little, the final slide, the promotion of, of Rijeka, where I teach, which will be the European capital of culture in 2020. And this is what these barracks now look like. So this is our new university campus. Uh, the only existing building that's left is the, the building in the very front. It looks like the more the grayish Austro-Hungarian building. But hopefully we can use these memoryscapes projects. I also have some material about Rijeka 2020. If you're interested in, I'm also inviting everyone to come to Rijeka in 2020. And hopefully uh, the campus, which is now uh, a bastion of intellectual freedom and ideas, could then actually maybe again have a plaque or something dedicated to the uh, volunteers that uh, fought in the Spanish Civil War. Thank you.